Walden Dahl, one of the finest bluegrass groups in the country, playing at a pizza parlor. It's like pearls before swine. Now I know what Jesus felt like when he was trying to preach and no one was listening. Also, also, also know if you start telling the truth, you get, you get killed. Someone will kill you. No one wants to hear the truth. 28 pages of dialogue. Okay, good, Doc. And uh, it's got to be, it's got to be verbatim, exactly like it was written. Uh -huh. I'm not gonna slouch around anymore. I really expect a performance from now on. Dialogue is very important. You ask Marlon Brando, he tell you, you got to, you got to deliver dialogue. Kathleen's gonna come on and dialogue coach you. So it's got to be exactly. It's got to be verbatim, word for word. Are you coming over here? I can, I can come in to grab a script. Oh, well, let's sit down here. Probably the best thing to do is sit down. You probably got more room out here. Let me just figure it out. I just don't want to get, I don't want to get them in the wrong place. Because then I'll be in worse trouble than I am now. I what, turned it what off. What Kenny would do if Jesus, if, if they had video cameras back in the time of Christ, and Kenny, Cruz and Kenny, had a video camera, and Jesus is getting ready to tell his disciples how to get to heaven, Kenny would turn off the camera and sit down and listen to him. <laughs> so, you wouldn't tape it. You wouldn't have done that. <laughs> you wouldn't be videotaping it, though. You wanted to talk to Carl. I did that the first time around. No. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. If Kennedy were getting assassinated and they had video cameras back in 1962, mm -hmm. he would have turned the camera off. You know that that guy only got this much film. That's how that's how long it is. The regular eight millimeter, the Zapruder tape of film. Is that that in French? Eight yeah. millimeter. That's as long as it is. That's all he got. That's worth millions of dollars. Did you see it cleaned up? Yeah. And since it's been digitized, yeah, yeah. it helps a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's still. You know, it's, it's a great to watch. There's a, there's a saying, shed in, shed out. I mean, he didn't, he never had the quality to begin with, so they're not, they're not going to improve the quality too much. But it's, you know, it's better. It's better than it was. Is Conrad okay? Did you get a little rough? Oh, I'm fine. Very good work, Don. Here I am. Right here. Right here. Yeah, I'm here. So yesterday, I take Conrad to my favorite place, my favorite breakfast place. They've got the, if you like, if you like this kind of food, they've got the best, best breakfasts. Arts Deli. I mean, it's really good. If you like scrambled eggs, if you like scrambled eggs well done, if you like bagels, if you, if you like home fries, the best. The best. And Conrad, and so, you know, and Conrad says, don't just give me anything I don't care. If he doesn't care, then we might as well just eat, we might as well just eat some Spam or something. You know? Conrad, you like Spam, don't you? Yes, yes. But as you go through spam. life, don't you develop a taste for things? Don't you, don't you look Only for Only what you want from me. Don't you look for quality? <laughs> it's good. Yeah, which, your stuff is great. The last guy I fired, the last guy I chased out of here with a samurai sword and was going to kill this guy. Is it like Wolf Burgers, right? No, what this guy would do, we'd get a burger. He'd take a burger, like a, a big burger. He'd eat it in three bites. <laughs> It'd be gone. Tasty. Now, if you've ever had a dog and you throw it up in the air, they'll grab it and wolf it down. That's what this guy did. The guy, I couldn't enjoy my food because he, he had just... He has swallowed it. So if he's going to swallow it, why am I spending eight dollars to send somebody to Apple Pan to get the best burger on the planet Earth okay. when I can just send? I just go to McDonald's because he's going to swallow it anyhow. He's, <laughs> he's not going to know the difference. He's not going to have a clue. And I completely forgot about that till yesterday. <laughs> You're killing me, Conrad. Yeah, you are. Are you personally by yourself with no help from anybody? These are color coded because they're sides, so we can take we can take each individual scenes and give them out, I guess. Once I once I figure out how to get once I put one together, figure out what one together, you guys should be able to figure out how to do the rest of them. Okay. Well, she just sent me out to get one for him. Just one, yeah, yeah, just one. <laughs> just give me one. Okay. So I see you really uh you you really checked in for the for the whole run here, huh? Just have to get one. <laughs> you know, the, funny thing, the funny thing about these scripts, here I'll tell you a secret, ready? I mean it looks good, right? What, ha what usually would happen on, the, on these movies, people would hire me to make, you know, I'd, I'd write a script, or I'd work with another writer, we'd write a script. They'd love the script, they'd love it. They'd give me the money to make the movie. I'd have a script supervisor, so, oh, they said and instead of the, and they would cut. You know what it, you know what it costs to cut a scene in 35 millimeter? Uh, it cost you about $130. Just to turn, just to turn the 35 millimeter camera on and get it running, get the tape running, and say, okay, here we go, stand by and action. It's a hundred bucks. It's a hundred dollars. I mean, I can show you per second what it costs to shoot on film. 
It's a lot of money. And I'm figuring this is the total cost from renting the camera, hiring the DP, hiring the assistant, hiring the second assistant, hiring the sound man, hiring the boom guy, going through the lab, going through telecine. It's expensive as hell. So I usually fire the script supervisor because the script supervisor is supposed to document what I do. That means don't stop me, don't get in my way from directing a movie, and they do. Every script supervisor comes up and says, well, they said Ann instead of thee. Well, I don't give a damn because I'm more worried about the intent than the right. content. If the intent is, I hate you, you son of a bitch, get out of here. If I don't say that exactly, it doesn't matter. Right. The point is, I hate you, leave. That's See, I, I, got, I got it across, and it worked just fine. It, it, worked, it, worked, it worked just fine. I'd go nuts if they stopped me for something like that. No, I mean, I, I, you know, I'd get mad and fire somebody in this. Like, well, why'd you fire them? Because they're stopping the production. They're slowing me down. I'm like a train going down the track. You've got to clear the path. You've got to get out of my way. Uh, it's, it's a democracy during pre-production. I'll listen to any idea. You got an idea? Well, let's hear that. But once I start shooting, the, clock is ticking, the clock's ticking away once we start shooting. And there's no time. I mean, we got to go. You got to work with somebody you trust, and you got to move with the speed of insanity, or you won't get the job done. On return to Frogtown, this idiot had a stopwatch, and he would say, "You got three minutes to shoot this scene." Yeah, you got three minutes to shoot this scene. I did. I, I did some of my best work under the gun like that. But it's difficult. I don't recommend it. I, I would not recommend to anybody they make a movie or act in a movie or have anything to do with the film business. I would recommend that you get a real job. Yeah, I would too. <laughs> get this man up here. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would recommend that you find some other line of work. But insurance. But here's the problem. Okay, I was going to cash you in a picture, but we'll, we'll just let you go. <laughs> hey, but I'm here though. Hey, camera guys don't talk. They're silent. Um, <laughs> The problem is why I can't do it, because I've got filmitis. Once you're bitten by the bug, once you have it in you that you've got to make films, and that's all you want to do, you're compelled to do it. It's like an addiction. I mean, I haven't done that many drugs, but from the people I know that have done drugs, even marijuana, which they say is not a habit for me, they crave it. They've got to have it. They live for it. And that's what it's like with film. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. So. A year ago, when I went to the doctor, because I wasn't feeling that well, he said, you know, you're okay, but I th he sent me to another doctor, and the doctor says, you are certified cinematically insane. <laughs> and there's nothing I can do about it, because there's no cure. There's a treatment. The treatment is to work with guys like Conrad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> what Conrad does is he keeps, he keeps, he keeps the, uh, the energy flowing because he keeps you active. It's like working out. So if I'm going to direct some real actors like you guys are, who obviously can memorize lines, can do plays, you guys are easy. But to get in shape for you, i got to run that marathon. I run the marathon with Conrad. I put him through the paces because Conrad can't say five words without screwing up. And I know you guys can probably talk for maybe a minute or two. So we're probably okay. Okay. These are, these are one, two, three, four, five. These are six different scenes from the new motion picture Blade Sisters. This is a movie that Blockbuster has already agreed to carry. They're, al they're already doing publicity on this movie, and uh, they like it. They like the movie so much that they want another one, and the other one is called Dead Boys, which is a script I wrote uh, four years ago. It was way, way ahead of its time. And a script written at the same time as Dead Boys, or a year after Dead Boys, is called Hell Dogs, and it's D-A-W-G-S, another urban action film. I get the franchise security uh, some of the films. I work for Blockbuster franchises and corporate. The franchises, they, own, they carry what they want. They, they do. The yes, they do. It's a very, Blockbuster is very political. Yeah. Uh, in order to get your films in there, if they know you, they'll buy your film sight unseen. If they don't know you and the film is incredibly good, they might not even look at it. It's a very political, very, very political thing. The reason Tiny York is so successful, she hired and became partners with one of the top buyers. For, uh, for Blockbuster, and that made her a multi-millionaire. I took Conrad to her house, and it's a mansion. It's a mansion. This girl started off, she was my makeup artist in 1988. She made up Kathleen Elizabeth in Rollerblade Warriors. This girl was like 18 years old. She knew nothing, nothing, nothing. The makeup was like cake. It's so thick. It was like, it was like a circus clown. So we didn't call her a makeup artist, we called her a cake-up artist. <laughs> She was bad. She was bad. Kathleen Kinmont, who married Lorenzo Lamas, hated her. I almost fired her a number of times, but I didn't, and she stuck around. I ended up working a lot with Tanya. We made a lot of movies together. 
And I made a lot of money off of her on the films that, I, that I've done. That's one. Where's the casting people? They're not casting. You know who these guys are next door? They're, they're supposed to be like the real deal next door. Yeah. I've seen them uh, people like, coming in. They do. They do like television and, and movies, stuff like that. Really? They say. They say. They say. Yeah, they they <laughs> say people. <laughs> what I want to do is uh, why Conrad's practicing on the couch. Uh -huh. we're, uh, we're we're becoming now with now with this movie here because I mean this this movie is like a, a very minuscule budget. But with my other company, Hollywood Entertainment Network Incorporated, which uh, is a Las Vegas corporation, we are in the process of raising a million dollars for that one. And one of the things that we're required to do for our investors is open a studio, similar to the studio we're going to have when we shoot down the street on Blade Sisters. So we're going to have a studio, which will be a big lot, big building, warehouse with, with casting department, wardrobe, makeup, distribution, offices. So what I, want to have, what I want to have Conrad do and what he's practicing for right now is I want to have him be the night watchman. So Conrad would actually live at the studio and make sure no one breaks in and steals anything. And here he is practicing over here. We see him over there? Damn. What's the address of that place? There's, there's, Conrad Hart. <laughs> there's, Con, there's Conrad Hart at work. It all works, doesn't it? Well, if I found actors who could really act, I could shoot the movie in one day. I could shoot this whole movie in one day. I think you're saying Because all you'd have to do is just act. And we could take little breaks. If you could give me, if you could go five minutes without, without stopping, we'd shoot the movie in one day. We'd make, we'd make cinema history. I'd save a fortune. I'd, I'd buy a new car. And movies have been shot in a day. I could name them. I, I have friends that have done it. Dr. Chicago in Ann Arbor, Michigan, shot in one day. Norman Mailer shot a movie one day called Wild 90. It was so successful, he did another one called Maidstone. And then he got really extravagant, did a movie in two days called Beyond the Law. Two days. He couldn't do it, but he had actors. He had actors who were really, really good. Killing of a Chinese Bookie, directed by John Cassavetes. All improv, the entire movie. There was, yeah. there was no script. I just recently saw that, and I was saying, these, where are these guys going? they got to be improv. -ing. They were improv. They were, these are, these are big-name guys, man. These are, these are big guys. Peter Falk, who was on Columbo. These are like some important people. Doing it. Cassavetes movies are all over the place. They are. Yeah, that's because... That's because what you can't, see, I don't let people improvise on my Zen films. I provide guidance. What we'll do is I'll, I'll usually write the line on the spot. I'll decide what the line's going to be, and then we'll rehearse it, and then we'll say it. But if you start improv and you'll get three or four different stories. Mm -hmm. yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Think one, two, three, four. If you give these to Kathleen, I think that's all you need. You should be able, you should be able to find what you're looking for. Oh, which one? Okay. I mean, that's, that's what the new set looks like. Okay. Well, so that's the one she wants. They're in order, but see, if you want to, if you want to help me, I'll bring you in. Uh, last person helping when he didn't enjoy the job. See, there's one. See, it's got that divider. See, that's like a divider. And if you put, like, yeah, if you put these in here, these little deals here. And so I'd ask Conrad to help, but I don't want to interrupt his beauty sleep. <clears throat> sure. In this little room right here? See that little room? In there. Okay, I'll tell you a story about that room, but I can't tell you what the sound out there. Uh, okay, that room, 202, here at 4737 Lancashire. I mean, I, I, I uh, Tanya York, by accident, by accident, uh, caught me one day, and she needed whoever was going to give her a ride to her new office didn't show up. So I happened to be at the old place cleaning up my stuff, the Rebel Corps. I gave her a ride here, and we had the news on the radio, and they were talking about a carjacking. And she said, wow, what a great idea for a movie. I said, yeah, let's do a carjack movie. So she said, what would it cost? I said, oh, it cost about, what, shot on film or shot on video? I said, shot on film, probably about 50000 Shot on video, I'd probably do it for 10000 So she gave me 7500 I put 5000 in my pocket, okay, and I spent 2500 on the movie. The movie made $75,000. Okay, the thing is slash Tracy, we'll see you guys Saturday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, good.
<laughs> well, I'm looking forward to that. Okay. It's whichever one, I'll All be right. here. <laughs> so, so the movie cost, uh, I mean, Tanya spent $7,500. I put $5,000 in my pocket. I spent $2,500 on the movie. And the movie made $75,000 for Tanya York. So it kind of paid off for her. She took that money and made the down payment on a house. Now, what I did is I let everybody know I just made a movie for $7,500. And I didn't tell them that I put $5,000 in my pocket. I didn't tell them that the movie only cost $2,500 because they would think, you can't do it. You can't make a movie for, uh, for $2,500. So I said it cost $7,500. So I went over to see two lawyers who had already financed a movie I made called It's Showtime, a movie about topless dancers. <clears throat> I went over there and, and showed them the movie. I said, here, take a look at this movie. It's called Carjack. And they, they thought it was shot on film because of the techniques I used with the high camera. And we filmed, looked at it, and it was, it was lit like a movie. It looked like a movie. And uh, they said, okay, let's, let's make something. What do you want to do? I said, I got a little movie. I got an idea, but I, I can't do it for $7,500. <clears throat> I'll do it for $20,000. So the guy opens the drawer. He takes out $9,500 in cash, and he writes me a check for the difference, and he gives me the money. The secretary came in and drew up a contract which said, Don Jackson's going to go make a movie. We're giving him $20,000. When he delivers the movie to us, we're going to try and sell it and distribute it. And then, after we get our money back, we'll give him 25% of anything the movie makes. And that movie is called The Queen of Lost Island, shot with the Sony TR-101 Pi-8 video camera, and all the editing was done in this room. The Carjack movie, I edited my, I wrote the script, I cast it, it's mainly uh, two people, it's a performance piece with two people. There's other people in the movie, Jill Kelly, who went on to become a very successful adult uh, film star. It's in the movie. There's other people in the movie, but it's a very good movie and it got great reviews. I did it under the name Maximo T. Bird because I didn't want to get a reputation for making video movies. I wanted to keep my name for films, for the 35 millimeter films I was shooting. But the movie got really good reviews. It made a lot of money. <coughs> I'm, sitting, I'm sitting in the office one day and there's a knock at the door and it's a, it's a very unusual lady who says, can I come in and sing a song for you? So being in the mood I was in, I said, yeah, hey, you're the third person today. Come on in, sing. So she sings, she looks at all the posters on the wall, and she says, where do you get money to make these movies? And I thought, well, it's a hard question to answer because the money comes from different places. It come, uh, I finance a lot of the films myself. I've had private investors, I've had lawyers, I've had doctors, I've worked for film companies, uh, different places. She said, okay, well, I was just wondering. A week, a week goes by, she comes back, she knocks at the door again. I said, oh, time for another song. She said, no, my boss wants to talk to you. My boss. <clears throat> I said, really? Well, what's he do? He raises money. For what? For oil and gas and for wireless cable. Limited partnerships. Well, I had never heard of a limited partnership. She said, he wants to raise money for a movie. So I went over to see the guy in Westwood. I was so broke I didn't even have a car. I didn't have a car that was running. So I had, uh, had uh, a friend of mine come over. And he took me over to Westwood, and the guy said, it's a private meeting, just between you and me, so I had the friend wait outside. <clears throat> so I went upstairs to talk to this guy, and it's like, I can't remember the, the movie star, but a very famous person lived in this, in this condo. Went up to talk to the guy, and in the, in the house, it was just surrounded with pictures of gurus, a lot of famous religious teachers, photos everywhere. So it was a very spiritual place. The guy says, I can raise you all the money you want to make movies. You tell me the amount, I can get you the money, I guarantee it. So, I didn't want to be greedy. I didn't say, let's get a million dollars and make a movie. I said, tell you what, because I just wanted to test the waters. I said, let's, let's raise 150000 and I'll make three movies for $150,000. The guy said, ah, oh, we'd have it for you in six weeks. I said, that's great. What do you want? He said, well, I've got to figure that out. I've got to figure that out. <clears throat> so I went back again for another meeting, and the guy says, okay, I've been thinking about your deal. I made some calls. I got all the guys lined up to raise your money for you. Uh, here's how it works on limited partnerships. On these guys that raise money, they get half. So I said, oh, so, so I'm not really going to have 150000 to make three movies. He said, no, you're not. You're going to have 75000 So I said, well, gosh, that means I can't shoot on film. I'm going to have to shoot on video. The guy said, well, come on. They're not buying the film. Anyhow, they're buying the video box. You just make some good artwork and people will buy it. They'll buy it based on the poster. The movies don't have to be that good. It's hard for me to make a bad movie because I care about what I'm doing. 
You know, it's like if you're a cook in a restaurant and you're capable of making a really good cheeseburger, I'm not just going to throw down something slop. I want to do the best I can do so I feel good about it. But I figured out I could make three video features for 75000 because I had made Queen of Lost Island for twenty. I had made Carjack for seventy five, and they really didn't cost that much. Queen of Lost Island cost maybe ten thousand, so I pocketed ten. Carjack cost seventy five, but I pocketed five, so I knew I could do it. So I took the deal. <clears throat> so then he does the bait and switch, and here's here's the bait and switch. The bait and switch is I get ready to go over to sign an agreement with the guy, and a stranger shows up, someone I've never seen before. And he says, I've checked out all your movies. They look really good. I've already got the money raised. We've got to sign some paperwork. Hey, you'll get 10000 Friday. I have another twenty for you on Monday. And this is, one of, this is one of the deals that was real. So as it turned out, I never signed anything with the guy. I went to see his lawyer who knew about how to raise money in limited partnerships. He put together a limited partnership deal. This guy got on the phone and uh, he said, get a cell phone because you're going to need it. And I got a cell phone, and the guy's calling me every hour, sometimes every half hour with reports. I would meet this guy at restaurants. He'd give me a check. Here's 5000 here's 10000 here's 15 here's 20 And this went on and on and on. And he kept giving me money, and I hired people. And this little room over here, where I started my little empire, based on shooting a video feature called Carjack, and then do another one called Queen of Lost Island, we had too many people coming in, so as luck would have it. I found a bigger place. After looking all over Los Angeles, all over North Hollywood, all over Studio City, Canoga Park, Winneka, Simi Valley, I decided, why don't I call the landlord because he manages apartment buildings. Give the guy a call and say what I want. So I call the guy. He said, what do you do? What, what do you need? I need a bigger place. Okay, bigger place. What are the requirements? I said, well, I need private parking. I'd like to have my own bathroom. I'd, like to have, I'd just like to have a little more room. He says, okay, here's what to do. Can you stand up? Can you walk out the door? Can you turn left? Can you go down the hallway? Can you knock and go in that room? As it happened, the guy was moving out. The cartoonist was moving out right down the hallway. So I had my art director come over. We spent a lot of money redecorating the room, refurnishing it, paneling it, moved in there. So now I got two rooms. This room here is still $200 a month. The other room is $350. So we're $550. I got my little empire going over here. And we've made around 15 features since then, 15 features. A lot of them on film, a couple things on, on digital video, which I think is the wave of the future. You're going to see more movies on digital video. But what happened is these guys that were raising money for me, that were giving me all this money to make movies, I spent all the money on films. I, I would spend the money on the, on the films. I would take a salary. I would pay everybody. The editors were getting $150 a day. One of the editors was getting, was getting $200 a day. These guys took forever to get the job done. I paid them, I paid myself a small salary, I paid all the actors, <clears throat> and then the money stopped. The money stopped. I didn't have the money to finish my one pet project, which was called Toad Warrior, which was the third in the Hell Comes to Frogtown series. The money stopped. So I went over and said, what's happened is the well run dry. No, what happened is they decided to quit giving me any money. They decided to keep it for themselves. So then I found out they're using my name to raise money that they're keeping. When I took these guys to court, we found out, and this is on public record, Santa Monica court, uh, the same court where OJ was, these guys raised $5 million, not a lot of money, but it's still $5 million, and I got 500000 of it, so I got 10%. I was kind of like their agent. They kept 90%, I got 10%. It's all a matter of public record. These guys were on the witness stand. They, they admitted it. So every time they raised a dollar, I got a dime. But towards the end, they didn't even want to give me the dime. They didn't even want to give me the crumbs off the table. So my name was used, abused, exploited. Uh, all the films I made was used by these guys to raise money. They raised $5 million. <clears throat> I had 500000 I made uh, six movies that were complete. I shot uh, ten other movies that I didn't have the money to finish editing. So the court says, you can keep those other movies. You can own those, which I did. And we've been finishing them and putting them out slowly. And uh, these guys uh, stayed in business, and they're still raising money. And uh, you're still doing limited partnerships. The FCC's investigated. The FBI's investigated. Um, the Attorney General's office looked into it. The Bureau of Corporations, the FTC, and there's been a lot of complaints from the investors. But the the story really is that uh, once you sign an agreement where you say you know that you're investing in a high risk venture, a film, chances are you'll never get your money back. The film may never be completed. If it's completed, it may never be sold. If it's sold, there may never be any profits. Once you sign that and you're an accredited investor, you can kiss your money goodbye. There's no way in hell to make money 
uh, investing in film. It just doesn't work unless you're a major studio, and believe me, they don't use their own money. They use other people's money. So what's got to happen? There's got to be a revolution. There's got to be a way of not dealing with studios, not dealing with distributors. The filmmaker has to make his own movies and sell the movies direct. I believe that's going to happen and is happening now on the internet where you can sell directly to the buyer. With the movie One Shot Sam, I plan on giving the movie away for free. It's a four-hour documentary about independent filmmaking. There's no cost. There's no charge. Just tell me you want a copy. And we will snail mail you a VHS cassette. Check out the website, www.oneshotsam.com. Check out the other sites, www.zendance.com, which is my complete filmography, a lot of attempts on guerrilla filmmaking, the story of soldiers in the cinema, how to make independent films for no money. And check out the other site for those of uh, <clears throat> for more spiritual teachings. Go to the Master of Light, uh, www.masteroflight.com for information on the uh, Master of Light Institute, for information on the New Church of Zen Filmmaking, how to gain enlightenment through making films and uh, making music. How to Become Aware, my story of how I gained enlightenment on a film called Shock Him Dead, <clears throat> working with Tracy Lords, the day that the light struck and transcended, and you'll understand some of those Bible stories about wandering in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and achieving cosmic consciousness, because it has been done, I can tell you personally it can be done. Anybody who wants to make a film out there, if you believe you can do it, if you can see yourself doing it, when I made my very first movie it was against all odds, there was no way in hell to raise money in Michigan. Hadn't made a film before, it was Catch-22. I'd find a, I'd find a millionaire, a guy, maybe a guy had a car dealership. I'd say, give me 10000 to make a movie. He would say, well, uh, you never made a movie before. And he was right. I had, but they were, they were regular 8, Super 8, or 16 millimeter. They weren't films for a theatrical release. So that was Catch-22. Nowadays, it's a lot easier to get money to make movies. It's a lot easier to make movies. There's, there, when I made my first film, The Demon Lover, which was a, a low-budget parody on horror movies, <coughs> the only market was the drive-ins. That's the only market. There was no other market. And drive your film would play like for three days. It wouldn't, it wouldn't play for much like it does now. There's no video market. The video didn't start really big until 81. <clears throat> and luckily, when the video market started, I had a wrestling documentary I had shot in Michigan right after The Demon Lover called Ringside in Hell. And that went on to become uh, I Like to Hurt People, which was a movie, kind of a docudrama inspired by Robert Altman's Nashville. New World bought the film Sight Unseen because it had to do with two subjects that were very popular, rock and roll wrestling. They bought it Sight Unseen for 50000 50000 advance. The movie made half a million dollars within six months. Because it was so successful, they said, are you working on anything else now? Can we get another film from you? I said, I am doing another movie. It's called Rollerblade. It's about futuristic rebel nuns with ballet song knives, but instead of using the knives for violence, they use the knives to heal. They use the power of the blade to heal. The guy says, let me see some footage. So I put together a little trailer, five minutes of footage, and went over to see the two top guys at New World. Have you ever been in a situation where you're going to a meeting? Have you ever been in a situation and you know that within an hour, your life is either going to change for the better or you're going to be fucked majorly? I had a feeling my life was going to change for the better. But they sure put me through some changes when I got to the meeting at New World. Went in, sat down. These guys are very calm. They're very cool. They just, you know, very cold. What have you got? Let's see your shit. They put in a tape. Two guys are looking at it who can decide my entire future. And I need the money because I've taken the 50000 I've paid back the investors on, on the wrestling film. I kept a few dollars, but I had to pay a lot of people back. They put in the movie and they see these girls on regular skates, not rollerblades, because the title came from roller skating and blade. That was the rollerblade before the rollerblade skates caught on. They look at the film and the guy, within three minutes of my five-minute trailer, he turns it off and it gets really quiet in that room at New World on Sepulveda. And I thought, oh my God, what's going to happen? And I'm scared. I spent $5,000 on my Visa card. I maxed it out. I charged the whole movie. The movie is shot with outdated ECO stock that was in a refrigerator. It shot with a wind-up Bolex. I've got no money. I've got bills. The guy has shut off the tape. He's not watching it. He gets out his calculator and he goes, okay, if we only sell 10,000 units, all right, da, 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 okay, uh, we'll give you, we'll you 50,000 for the movie. You can come in Friday and we'll start giving you payments. Let's work out a payment plan. We're not going to give you the $50,000 all at once. Let's work out a payment plan. We'll give you 20000 to start. We'll probably give you like 10000 a week. We're going to put an executive in charge of production. 
and go shoot your movie. It sounds like it'll be fun. We want to put this out as New World Videos first made for video feature. We're going to say that. Made for video feature. And they put that on the posters. They took out full page color ads in Billboard magazine, which was unheard of. Full page color ads. The film was reviewed in Variety. Rollerblade was in every video store. Here's a movie shot for 5000 on my Visa card that made $1 million for New World. $1 million. It made so much money. It made so much money that next time when I wanted money, I didn't have to go in and show them a trailer. I said one word, Frogtown. They gave me a million and a half dollars based on one word, Frogtown. It's a fact. It happened. It doesn't happen a lot today because the video market's not what it was. Hell Comes to Frogtown was intended for a theatrical release. It was shot 35 millimeters, SAG with Rowdy Rowdy Piper, Lissando Bergman. What happened is New World, after they had ordered 2,000 prints for a major, major theatrical release, went bankrupt. They had made a series of bad decisions, a lot of bad movies. They went bankrupt, they ran out of money, and they couldn't afford to do the prints, and Hell Comes to Frogtown, so as a result, it went direct to video. A friend of mine had been dealing with some other creatures that weren't frogs, they were amphibious, they were turtles. The Grand, Fog, the grand uh, Turtle Meister, Kevin Eastman had invented a series of characters called the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. While I was going under, he was going to the top in a Learjet because uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles became one of the most successful independent franchises in the history of the universe. Kevin is, is a good friend. He's been in a lot of the movies I've done recently. He's terrific. He's a really smart guy. He's smarter than I was because at New World, when I signed my contract in order to get Hell Comes to Frogtown made, there's a little clause that says, I assign all rights, title, and interest. Now, most people don't know what that means. Gee, what does that mean? I assign all rights, title, and interest. It means you're giving up everything. You're giving them the sequels, the, pre the prequels, the remake rights, the toys, all of it. I had to give it all away to get the movie made. Now, at one point, we were going to make Hell Comes to Frog Town for $150,000 with my Bolex. But then I made a mistake. Some of the mistake I made here. <coughs> we wrote a script. They were going to give me 150000 based on a word, Frogtown, go make the movie. But once they read the script, they loved it. They loved the script so much, they decided to put more money in it. They decided to make it in 35. They decided to make it SAG. They decided to put more executives in charge of the production. And it turned out to be, uh, it turned out to be a bigger film. And uh, it was a good experience. I enjoyed working SAG. I enjoyed 35. I enjoyed all the great actors I was able to work with. But I didn't have the creativity. I didn't have the freedom that I would have had. With the Bolex, probably the Bolex movie would have made more money if you look at 150,000 film and what it can make as opposed to how long it takes to recoup 100, one and a half million for a movie a shot for a movie. Conrad, we quit coughing. Uh, if you look at the two differences in price, 150,000 uh, dollars, not a bad price for a direct to video, but a million and a half is a lot of money to spend on a movie that's going direct to video. Had it gone to theaters, it would have been worth it would have been worth the price, but it didn't. So bad management at New World, but it was a fun experience. I learned a lot of things. After that, we did Rollerblade Warriors, where I had a lot more freedom. But one of the things I did as soon as we started shooting Rollerblade, War Rollerblade Warriors that freaked out the producer is uh, right in the middle of the shoot, I tore up the script in front of her and threw it away. And I think we made a lot better movie without following that script. So this script is not a, it's not a roadmap. It's not a blueprint. It's, uh, it's an invitation to a journey. So come along. Get on the bus. Uh, let me do the driving, and we should have some fun. Thank you. <laughs> You're next. No. No. I bet you got a story to tell. Yeah, she's got you a story. You and I will have to have a conversation. She's got a story to tell. Yeah, I didn't think you were here. I wouldn't have been out here making all this noise. Oh, I don't mind. If it bothers me, I'll let you know. <clears throat> Boy, I think you would. Use the couch, you know. <laughs> Set up. All right. So when Conrad's not fucking up dialogue for me, he's coughing all through my interview. So at least the guy's consistent. It's like he couldn't hurt me anymore. If someone were saying, Conrad, here's another hundred bucks. Here's another hundred bucks. Fuck the guy. Fuck the guy. Screw him over. Screw him <laughs> over. Interrupt his life. Make him feel bad. Create friction. Create negativity. Be hostile. He couldn't, it couldn't be any worse if he were getting paid more money. You give the guy a hundred dollars a minute, he couldn't fuck up his lines anymore. And he gives him a hundred and ten in performance, huh? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, uh... A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of friends of mine who played by the rules have been very successful financially. Um, certainly probably the most, the most successful, obviously, the king of the world. He certainly played by the rules more than anybody else. He did one low-budget film. The first film he made had a budget of a million and a half dollars. That was Piranha 2, the spawning. 
but he didn't have any control over the movie. The movie was made by a group of Italians. He didn't speak their language. There was a real communication problem. But the stuff that Cameron did on the movie is pretty good. It was mainly the effects, the flying fish, the way that was done using the Lidecker method with the flying fish on uh, monofilament fishing line, like they flew the rocket man in the serials. The flying fish were great. You couldn't see the wires. But it was after that horrible experience that he got the idea for Terminator. I've actually got at home a sheet he gave me. It's like, it's like an eight and a half by 11 sheet he wrote with a pencil. An idea for Terminator. I've got that sheet. He did that in a restaurant one night. And that led to Terminator, probably one of the most successful franchises in history. The first one, the second one, now he's working on Terminator 3. The writer of uh, the Terminator novels, Randy Frakes, has <clears throat> been my friend since 1981. Randy actually wrote the Hell Comes to Frogtown script with me. And some of the other films, too. He wrote uh, Rollerblade Warriors. He wrote Kill, Kill, Overkill. And now Randy's at work. Randy actually did the first draft on True Lies because Cameron had to have a script real fast to show to Arnold, so Randy wrote that. He had his name on the billboards in the early ads, but the Writers Guild made him take his name off of it. But uh, Randy's working with me. We're, we're talking to Cameron now. We're doing the movie called One Shot Sam. We're trying to get uh, Jim to do a little cameo. I think he probably will for old time's sake because of all the, uh, the history we had together at New World. I've got lots of Super 8 footage of Jim Cameron uh, directing uh, the famous maggot rape scene uh, in Galaxy of Terror. And uh, I'll show that to everybody if you don't come out here and talk to me, Jim. You hear that? You owe me a favor, buddy. You told me you'd come out and grip on my movie, and now I'm calling that favor. And I think Bill Paxton promised he'd help me, too, when we're shooting that rock video, Martini Ranch, out there. So I might have to call on you guys, now that you're rich and famous, to come help the old Frogmeister, and let's get this movie done. One shot, Sam. You get any of that? Or? No. Okay. Oh, boy. Cut. <laughs>